Hi guys, Pastor Chris here. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study at our home. This is our second live stream from the house uh, on Wednesday night for our Bible study. Um, since our orders came from our governor to stay at home and that's what we're doing. So we are in the book of Acts. We're gonna be in the second chapter of Acts. If you'd like to go ahead and turn to the second chapter of Acts, we're gonna be looking at quite a few verses today. Uh, also, while you're turning, if you're turning in your Bible, uh, I will say that the notes were posted earlier this afternoon on our Facebook page. Hopefully that was convenient for you to go on and print and uh, you can follow along. And I have the scriptures in there also just to save time. So I'm not stopping and waiting for people to turn in their Bibles. So again, second chapter of Acts, um, Let's go ahead and start. I always like to start with prayer. So let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've created. Thank you that we can praise you and focus on you, Lord, right in the middle of all this mess. We do lift up our not only our nation, but our world to you right now, Lord. We pray that you would move in this coronavirus, Father, that there would be quick remedy to, Lord, to this worldwide pandemic. Pray for the scientists, the biochemists, Lord, that are working, the technicians, God, that are working around the clock trying to develop and distribute a vaccine, Lord. Pray, Father, that you would most of all show your glory in it all. Pray that you don't take this word tonight, Lord, translate it to the language of our hearts. Meet us where we are. We want to be changed by your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, the book of Acts, we've been studying this for uh, several weeks now, and there's been two themes that we are rallying around. Those themes are not in your notes tonight. I just wanted to save time, but I'll just read them quickly. Uh, one of the themes is that the, this idea that this Christian church, this first Christian church that we see here in the book of Acts, they didn't have really anything going for them. It was a new church with unproven leaders. They weren't educated. They had no money, no means modern means for spreading the gospel. They sure didn't have the means that we have today. They faced incredible opposition and enormous obstacles, yet they were empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that's the difference, to do the impossible and bring a simple salvation message to the lost world. And taking that for me and our church and us for where we are right now, it's encouraging to me to know that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He chose us, he will use us, warts and all, as it were, and whatever happens and during this time in our church is gonna be a God thing, we're convinced of that. Number two, the second theme is that persecution was served up to squash the church, but instead God used it to, to do the opposite. I love that. God used that very persecution that the enemy served up to, to squelch the church, as it were, and he used that to spread it like wildfire. And uh, so where that the takeaway for me and for us is each one of us has a past and the enemy wants to use that past against us to discourage us to discourage us and cause us to want to quit. But God uses those very things that the enemy uses to take us down and he'll use them for not only his glory, but our good. And that's an awesome thing. He uh, and I believe this that out of our greatest hurts can come our greatest ministry opportunities. So we are indeed in the second chapter of Acts. Um, one of the key verses in this study so far has been Acts 1-8 where Jesus said these words, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so as believers, these apostles that were here in this scene, they had the Holy Spirit in them already because they were, became, they were believers. But Jesus was saying here that there was another level that they needed to experience in order to have the power to do what he had called them to do. And what did he call them to do? Again, we know, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was a tall order. They needed that empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He said, so you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And in this scene tonight, in chapter two, 
we're going to see this very event. So chapter two, I'm gonna start at verse thir uh, one, and I'm gonna go through 13. So verses one through 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were they were staying there were excuse me there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthenians, or Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. So that's where we'll stop reading for tonight. In the last couple of weeks, we unpacked verses one through three, and we saw some pretty amazing phenomenon in those verses. We, a mighty rushing wind. Uh, we saw tongues of fire separating and resting on each of them. The Holy Spirit was indeed coming in power and making his presence known. And now in verse four, we see a whole new phenomenon happening. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, note that this wasn't just a free-for-all. <laughs> Verse 4 says that it wasn't a free-for-all. Verse 4 says it this way, as the Spirit enabled them. Now again, Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and that my friends, is exactly what was going on here. The Holy Spirit was coming on them in power to do what they could not have done on their own. That's what it's all about. Again, I say the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about power. Power to do what was impossible in human terms. So somebody could ask this question. Why do we need power to do what we cannot do on our own? <laughs> Does God call us to be superheroes? Are we supposed to leap over a tall building in a single bound? Are we supposed to be supernatural and you know just walk around floating about three feet off the ground? Maybe you know some of those people. I like what one comedian says. He, he says there's some people are oversaved. <laughs> what he means by that is they're to so heavenly bound that they're of no earthly good. They're always talking up in the clouds. You know, you ask them, are you hungry? They'll say, hungry for more Jesus. <laughs> Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about here. We're not, we're not talking about being so heavenly bound. We're not talking about floating on a cloud and, 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 and walking around talking in spiritual language all the time talking over everybody's head, quoting scripture to everybody like that. That's not a sign of spirituality. We need power from the Holy Spirit, guys, to do what we cannot do on our own because simply this, as spirit-filled Christians, God will give us God-sized tasks to do. That's the bottom line. You can bank on that. And by the way, if he's not giving you a God-sized task, then you know, maybe you need to take a look at that. Because God is always stretching. God is always drawing us out. He's always taking us further than we thought we'd ever go. He's always healing us beyond what we thought we could be healed. He'll take the very things, like in my situation, I recently celebrated 22 years 
of sobriety from alcohol on March 12th, as a matter of fact, that's my sobriety day. And that's part of my testimony. I always say that God did for me what I could not do for myself. See, I had made many attempts, but see, I, I needed power from on high to be able to do what my past attempts failed at doing. God will call us to do things. I would have never, ever, in my, in my wildest imagination, dreamed that I'd be standing before you, speaking maybe to hundreds of people here in a Bible study on, the, on live stream. I never thought I'd be speaking in public at all, much less a minister of the gospel. Are you kidding me? But see, God didn't rally around my opinion of myself. And he doesn't rally around your opinion of yourself either. He saw things in me I didn't see. He said I was a, a winner, and I said I was a loser. He, he said I was uh, uh, fearfully made before the foundations of the earth. I said I was irrelevant. I said that I didn't have anything to offer. I was glad to, be, to blend into the woodwork. He said, no, Chris, you're a leader. See, again, he sees things in us that we don't see, and he can draw them out with the power of the Holy Spirit, whereas we would never be able to tap into those things. If I was not filled with the Spirit, if I did not open myself to God 22 years ago, who knows where I'd be right now? I sure wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I want to tell you, I like doing what I do. This is me. See, I used to think it wasn't me. See, that's another thing. In my humanity, I don't even really even know who I am, what I want, and what I need. I think I do. We sure chase a lot of things, don't we? Those are the things that we think we need. The Holy Spirit knows what we need. He knows who we are. He created us. And when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, when it comes on us with this dunamis power from on high, that dunamis is the Greek word that we get the word dynamite from, that power, that dynamic power from on high, he, we, can, we can then start doing the things that we never thought we could do. For the Lord, not for our own ego, that's for sure. He will give us spiritual gifts to use for the kingdom. He will do, we will do things that we never dreamed we'd do. We'll become the person that we always were meant to be. And we will be enabled, by the way, to face things that we never thought we could face. And not only face them, but be victorious over them. He takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for good every time so now look at this situation that we're in right now this coronavirus we're on lockdown at least the state of california is heard today that now florida is too so now it's florida new york and california that i know of maybe there are other states but we're impacted by this so what's a person to do Sit around, get your news from Facebook. By the way, I don't recommend that. <laughs> Too many people are getting their news from Facebook, guys. That's, that's, that's crazy. You just gonna sit around and, and read what other people have posted. You're gonna, gonna look at this and that and the other. And then pretty soon we're wringing our hands and, we're, and, we're, and when we get the fear that starts coming on us when the truth of the matter is, is that God's called us to not only endure these things but rise up through them and be better off for them. I'm convinced that God is going to do something in this. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back to the old me that, was, that existed even two weeks ago. I want to emerge out of this different. How about you? And see, that's what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. He empowers us to face the hard things in life and emerge victorious over them. In difficult times like to fight this crisis that we're facing right now, I'm glad that I don't have to face it alone. Amen? I don't have to face it in my mere humanity. By the way, if I did, it would eat my lunch. Pretty, pretty sure of that. But power to do what I could not do on my own. And these apostles, they had power to do what they could not do on their own. And that's why it was so important for Jesus to tell them, again, to stay here. A couple of weeks ago, I asked you, what would happen if they didn't stay there in Jerusalem? <laughs> it would have been a whole different story, but they did stay there. Jesus is saying to us right now, stay here. 
Stay where you are. Let me do the thing I want to do during this time. Stay in this crisis right now until power comes on you. I want to change you. I want to do something in this now that I have your attention. <laughs> turn off the Facebook, turn off the TV, uh, put down the bag of chips. I need your attention right now. I want to do something in you. Stay here until the power comes on you, power from on high. You'll receive that power and you'll be able to emerge out of that a different person. And here in, the, in our story here in the second chapter of Acts, by the way, isn't it kind of funny that I'm bagging on Facebook and yet here I am live streaming on Facebook. <laughs> So stay off of Facebook except to look at the live stream. <laughs> Just not uh, here in the second chapter of Acts, in the upper room, we see this power come on, not just 12 apostles, but all 20, 120 that were in the room. And that power was evidenced by the speaking in other tongues that they did not understand. I don't know about you, but I don't have the ability to just start speaking another language. <laughs> But verse 4 says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit, or as the Spirit, enabled them. So this scene was repeated, by the way, several other times later in the book of Acts, and we'll, we'll get to that later. The same scene, though, filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues. But this scene here in the second chapter of Acts that we're studying tonight is the fulfillment of what Jesus had spoken about and is chock full of intentionality if you really look closely. So let's get into that. Remember, this is happening during the Feast of Pentecost. We went over that last week. This was one of the largest of the Jewish celebrations and there are people there from all over the known world. What a coincidence, huh? Different cultures, different languages converging in one place. And this was yet another powerful and glorious demonstration of the Holy Spirit coming with power. This being the first time anything like this had happened. And it was done deliberately so that others would not just write this off as a bunch of people in a big room speaking gibberish. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? The people outside heard through the opening in the windows what was going on in this room. There was something supernatural going on up there. Something going on that these Galileans could not have done on their own. Speaking in language they, they didn't know. The people outside did understand and added some supernatural validity as it was, as it were, to the scene. They basically said, hey, I hear them speaking and it's not just gibberish. They're not just drunk. I hear them. That's that's my language. I understand what they're saying. How are they doing that? And if you look at the text that we read, it says in verse 5, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They heard this sound, and a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears in our own native language? See, one thing that you need to understand, this, this is even more intentionality here, is that Galileans did not have the greatest reputation for being the most advanced and learned culture around. They were looked down upon by other cultures. They weren't really educated. So this was even more astonishing that these unschooled Galileans uh, were doing this. We're doing what? Well, verse 11 it says, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. See, they weren't just up there going, oh, you know, and, and, and talking, and, and, and they sure weren't preaching at the crowd. They didn't know the crowd could hear them. They were up, up in the room. The Holy Spirit came on them. They began to speak. The people outside heard and said, hey, I recognize what they're saying. This wasn't an orchestrated thing by the men. They didn't even know people were listening. And they were what they were doing was what they, they were declaring the wonders of God in tongues they did not understand. This is an amazing scene. The crowd was utterly amazed, the Bible says. And we know 
that some used it as to ask a serious question. What does this mean? Oh, that we would have that same kind of heart in what's going on right now rather than giving in to all the negativity and, and wringing our hands and, and, and getting involved in all the hearsay and fear mongering and, and blame game and all the things that are going on in our culture that we can just simply look to the Lord and say, God, what does this mean what we're going through right now? Because it didn't take you by surprise, Lord. Some had that same attitude. But others use it as a time to discount the move of the Spirit as man-made and said, ah, they've had too much wine. There's always going to be people that will do that when God moves. Another aspect of this that makes it amazing, to me at least, is that this was a new and utterly amazing thing that happened. The Holy Spirit coming in power and demonstration of the supernatural. Crazy. So let's recap. Rushing mighty wind, tongues of fire separating and falling on each of them, and now all of them were empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak in languages they did not understand. I mean, it's mayhem, folks. Yet, yet, they were all unified. That's amazing to me. They were all unified in that room, and that's why it's exactly the scene that Jesus had told them was going to happen. Wait here until the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, they were in obedience there. They had been in prayer and they were unified before this happened and they were unified even after it happened. I like how one author put it. His, he has an interesting take on this scene. I'm quoting here. It says, ever since the early church fathers, commentators have seen the blessing of Pentecost as a deliberate and dramatic reversal of the curse of Babel. Now that is an interesting thought. I had to, I had to ponder that. If you're, if, I'm not going to take time to explain the story of the Tower of Babel. It's in the book of Genesis. But just a very, very short, very, very brief recap. Um, I'll hit the high points. The people were full of themselves and they decided to build a tall tower that extended into the heavens and basically they could kind of almost rise up and be, they wouldn't need a God because they were going to be basically attain that level by, by coming all together as one and building this tall tower that reached into the heavens. And God saw their plan and thwarted it by what? By confusing them, by mixing uh, their, them with different languages. So it's really the opposite that was going on. He, he gave them all of a sudden different languages to confuse them and to thwart their efforts. Here is a reversal of all that. They're speaking different tongues, but yet they're all unified because the big difference was the Holy Spirit came on them and empowered them to do it. So let's talk about the spiritual gifts, or the spiritual gift of tongues. The original Greek term here used in this in the scene here in the second chapter of Acts, and I don't want to overwhelm you with Greek as if I'm some kind of Greek scholar, but it's there in your notes. It is, uh, and I'm going to try to pronounce this: heteraeus or heteraeus glossius. Okay, so what? <laughs> well, it's the same term used in the uh, First Corinthians 12. 4 through 11, where Paul wrote the Corinthian church concerning spiritual gifts. So with that in mind, I want to read to you now what 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11 says about the idea of spiritual gifts. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. Um, it says there in verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the Spirit distributes them. See, it's the Spirit. It's not man-made thing here. It's the Spirit there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one of the manifestations of the, of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of that same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. 
to another gifts of healing by that one spirit. Look, do you see the repetitiveness here? He's doing it intentionally. He's showing the Corinthian church it's by the spirit. See, another thing you have to understand is the reason that he's writing the Corinthian church here is under this idea of what orderly worship looks like and what the spiritual gifts look like is because the, the Corinthian church was a mess at the time. <laughs> he was one of the founding uh, pastors of that Corinthian church and yet he had gone off and, and was out doing other ministry work and so he left them there to their own devices and all kinds of craziness was going on there. Don't even have time to unpack what a mess they were. But he kept, he keeps reiterating this point, that same spirit, that one spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit. Verse 10, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different tongues, kinds of tongues, and still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So, just as he determines, and, and back in, um, in, the, in the main text, it says that, um, that they were all filled with the Spirit, began to speak in tongues, just as the Spirit enabled them. So we have to understand this, guys. We cannot talk about these spiritual gifts without talking about the Spirit with a capital S. It's all about the Holy Spirit. These are distributed by the Holy Spirit. They are, they are monitored, they are used and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that term, by the way, used for, that, that says, that as the Spirit enabled them, or in one, term, in one uh, um, translation it says, as the Spirit gave the utterance. In the Greek, it indicates a spiritual prompting or ecstatic prompting. It's, like, it's where we get the word ecstatic from. It, it, uh, it's a prompting. So this isn't just a, simply a matter of translating. It's not like the Holy Spirit was, to, uh, was serving as some kind of master translator there, as if he were just translating into all these different languages. This was a prompting. This was an ecstatic prompting, a spiritual prompting by the Holy Spirit to do this. This that joy that bubbles up. That, that I, that's why I like the idea of ecstatic prompting because that when the Spirit comes on us and then and then it's just demonstrated through that spiritual gift, it's always an overflow of what's going on inside. It's not about the actual demonstration of the gift. It's a it's a demonstration of what's going on inside. It's an ecstatic prompting of the Spirit coming on us. Sometimes it comes during powerful worship. Sometimes it's precious in our own uh, prayer closet at home. That's how it happens often to me. But it's an ecstatic prompting of what is going on on the inside, the what is welling up, and the joy of the Spirit welling up in me as, I, as I'm able to use this gift because it was enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. I hope that that is blessing you. I, I feel it. I feel the Spirit on me as I'm, as I'm even teaching this. But guys, again, this is a gift from the Holy Spirit, and it comes just as He determines. So what is the gift of tongues used for? Well, obviously, the Holy Spirit is not going to distribute a gift that has no purpose. <laughs> right? He's not going to distribute a gift that has no use. He's not going to distribute a gift that is just a one-time thing, especially when Paul carefully writes to the church later on, uh, the New Testament church, uh, the Corinthians, and, and the book of Romans. There's also references to it. If, if, if the Holy Spirit gives a gift to the church, it has purposes. It has a purpose. I want you to pay attention here because this is good. You need to understand this because... Our church, Crossover Church of God, we are a Pentecostal church. We are a charismatic church. We believe in the full gifts of the Spirit. This is what we believe. First of all, again, what, what is the purpose of the, of the gift of tongues? First of all, it is a gift of communication between the believer and God. I love that. It's a gift of communication between the believer and God. I believe that's in your notes. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says it this way. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries. By what? By the Spirit. 
by the Spirit. By the Spirit, I'm uttering mysteries. Not, not mysteries to Him. Not even mysteries. I mean, it, he, it's not a mystery to Him, but it's a mystery to me even. I don't even... I don't even understand exactly what I'm praying. All I know is that my spirit is being edified when I do it. And later on in that same chapter, verse 14 and 15, it says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my mind is unfruitful. And what he means by that is my mind, you know, like when I'm speaking to you right now in English, I have to concentrate and I have to use enunciation and I have to use vowels and verbs and all of that. But when I'm speaking through the spirit, when the spirit is speaking through me, and, and tongues that I don't understand, I can disengage from that. I, I just let it flow from the Spirit. It's like I'm just literally, from a fire in my belly, it's coming out. And that's what he means by my mind is unfruitful. In, in other words, I'm not even thinking about what's happening here. So what shall I do? I will pray by my, with my Spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. So he's saying, have balance. We're not going to just walk around praying in the Spirit all the time. It's good for me to talk to God. I talked to God today. I talked to God five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago before whatever time it is. Before we started, I prayed just before this Bible study. And you know, when I prayed in English, I prayed to God with my mind. God, help me to relay this information. Give me an anointing, Lord. Speak through me, Father. And Paul is saying that's good. It's good to have both. And then he says, I will sing with my spirit but I will also sing with my understanding. So now he's talking about singing. Oh boy, singing in the spirit, that's a beautiful thing. I've experienced that. But he's also gonna sing with understanding, which means seeing, engaging in the words like we do on Sunday morning. So this gift of tongues, it's an important part of a believer's personal devotional life. I believe it, I live it, I do it. I recommend it. <laughs> it's possible. I mean, excuse me. It is a beautiful and fulfilling experience. And again, remember, it's not about the prioritizing the gift and, hey, look at this, what I'm doing, and all that stuff. It's about power. It's about the Holy Spirit coming on, on us in power. And, and doing inside, doing a work inside, and then what comes, what comes out is a, is a product of what's going on on the inside. Again, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power to do what we could not have done on our own. It's about getting out of the natural realm, guys, and getting into the supernatural. It's been said that the gift of tongues is a personal language of prayer given by God whereby the believer communicates with God beyond the limits of knowledge and understanding. I like that. I didn't, I didn't write that. I wish I would have. I'll read it again. I don't believe it's in your notes. It's been said that the gift of tongues is a personal language of prayer given by God, whereby the believer communicates with God beyond the limits of knowledge and understanding. See, beyond the limits of knowledge and understanding. See, doing what you could not do on your own what it's all about okay so that's the first purpose for the gift of tongues it's a gift of communication between the believer and God secondly the gift is for corporate edification of the congregation or the crowd corporate edification so we, before we were talking about it's good for you now we're going to talk about it's good for the crowd corporate edification well, what does that look like? In that same 14th chapter in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote this in, in verse 5. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. Okay, what does prophesy mean? You know, I sometimes that gets a little bit overused. When we kind of think of what somebody that prophesies as somebody that's just kind of weird, you know. Proph prophecy, prophesying, guys, is literally this speaking the words of God. And what Paul is saying here is that as powerful as, that, as, the, as the gift of tongues is, he, he'd like to see them even more, more so prophesy because that is something that I'm speaking in English to you that you understand, hey, I believe God is saying this, guys, to us. I was praying in my own prayer time today. I say this to my wife all the time. 
You know what? I'm really feeling that God's leading me to, the, to, 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 right? My wife's right there. <laughs> Say hi, Levi. Hi. <laughs> um, I mean, I, and that, you know, that's speaking the words of God. It's, it's your, your, your spirit testifying to what you believe God is saying. And that is edifying to the crowd. Then he goes on, he says, For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. So what, it, what we're now seeing is the tongues used in corporate worship for the purpose of edifying the crowd. If you've ever been inside our church building, you know that that happens at times. I'm part of that. That happens. <laughs> and it's a powerful thing when it does happen. And we do things a little bit different at our church. When it happens, we pay attention. <laughs> we actually record it. And we document it. And we have documented every single one of the of the we call prophetic words or the tongues and interpretation we've we've documented every single one since i've become pastor and god speaks in a linear fashion he's not all over the place you can see the pattern you can see the uh consistency in what he's speaking to us he's not erratic and it's good it's, it's for edification of the crowd there's there there is tongues and then there's uh, afterwards a person as, as they're giving the tongues they're also supposed to pray for the interpretation but at times God uses other people for the interpretation but the whole purpose is that there's tongues and then there's interpretation for the edification of the crowd and not once not once has it ever happened where it was not for the edification of the crowd when there was when there was uh, interpretation and then later on in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 14 Paul says it this way so it is with you. Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. See, it's all about building up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they will interpret what they say. That's exactly what I just said. So that's how it works. In corporate worship, there's, it's a different kind of usage. So we have it for ourselves, uh, for our own communica communication, and relationship and devotional time with God and then we have it for corporate worship for the edification and the building up of the church so again I say you have to understand the context here chapter 14 of 1st Corinthians was written by Paul to bring that church back into alignment because they were just doing it by letter and what I mean by that is they were they it was like letter rip <laughs> And uh, it didn't go. They were doing all kinds of things. There was crazy things going on, not just in the spiritual gifts, but, but uh, oh, it's just, I, it, it would be shocking if I told you some of the things that was going on in that church and endorsed even by the leadership. They were doctrinally off on so many things. So he's correcting them and bringing them back. As you read the, you read the whole, the two letters, the, the two Corinthian letters, you can get the gist of what he was saying there. So he was getting them back, in this particular case, he was getting them back to the idea of orderly worship. What, why does it have to be orderly? Because it needs to build up the church. It needs to be, God is a God of order. You know, and I, I grew up in that era where it's like, man, just let it rip, man. If you feel it, go for it, man. You know what? No, no, it doesn't have to be that way. God's a God of order. He doesn't want it to be confusing. And so we can, we can control that. And that's exactly what Paul was saying, is that it needs to be for the building up of the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 28 is really where he starts really putting some skin on this idea. And in fact, in, in the NIV version, the heading there before verse 26 says it this way. It says, good order in worship. <laughs> In other words, guys, this is how you should be doing church. He says, "Then what then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. See, he says it again. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at, least, or at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret 
If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. See? <laughs> now, I've been guilty of just letting her rip. Sometimes when I just feel a spirit coming on me. But you know what? I can control that. And if it's something that's going to be spoken for the edification of the crowd, then that's when I would raise my volume. And we do it even, again, we do it in a very productive and orderly fashion. So what is this all about? What, is, what Paul is saying here, guys, is that tongues with interpretation is an important part of corporate worship. However, it needs to be done in a way that is beneficial for building up of the church and not for adding confusion. I hope I made that part clear. And then our text tonight ends in chapter 2 with verse 13. That's as far as we read earlier. Verse 13 says, Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. So we're going to pick up that story next week at verse 14 where Peter full of the spirit by the way he's one of those that was in that upper room stands up and gives one of the most powerful and compelling sermons of all time leading to 3,000 people being saved under the power of the Holy Spirit this ordinary man this impetuous man this guy that had just not too far in the, in the recent past denied Jesus Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. This man, full of the Spirit, stands up and gives a speech, and 3,000 are saved. See, we need that power. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Thank you, God, for this discussion. Thank you for your instruction, Lord. I pray, God, that, uh, that those listening, Father, would... Um, that they would call out to you, Lord, realizing, God, that you're not, call, you're not asking them to face this coronavirus crisis on their own. We need you, Father. I pray that you would indeed empower us to face this, empower us to do the things we could never dream of doing, Lord. Empower us, God, to change for the better during this time and not get worse, God. I mean, so many of us, Father, are just going to sit around and gain weight uh, during this time and get lazy and and, but, and I don't mean that even just physically, Lord. I mean that even figuratively in our minds and our spirits, Lord. We don't want to, uh, we want to get trimmed, Lord. We want to come out of this thing in better shape than we were going in, Father. I'm talking spiritually, Lord. Emotionally, Father. Have our minds straight, Father. Empower us, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit right now fall on, us, on this church. And I mean, God, not just this building, not just that church building over on 5th and Woodworth. This church all that are within earshot right now, Father. Let your power fall on our homes. Let your power fall on our apartments, Lord. Meet us right where we are, God, that we could do indeed what we could not do on our own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to come into your home here. Hope you were blessed by that. And uh, we will see you the next live, broad, live stream will be Sunday um, and uh, at 10 o'clock. So bless you. Good night.